Okay, guys, we're going to start. I'm so eager to meet with you guys today. Like, I'm so excited. Uh, for those of you who are local, we just want to make an invitation. So Capel Bible has a Free Grace Women's Bible Study, Wednesday morning, 9 to 11. We said, see ya, we'll see ya in fall. And there was an uproar, right, Marcy Elkins? And so we're starting back July 10th, and we're doing From Fear to Faith. So we'd love for you to come. It's growing, and um, it's just been awesome to see God working there. Okay, today's session is entitled, How to Have a Passion for Jesus and His Purposes in the Earth. So many of you know, I love Hawaii. I had family growing up there, so stayed with them from girlhood on, and it means a lot to me. So one of the pastors there, his name Kahu, and it's short for Kahupilo. He's on island. And he was always so passionate about God's word. And so one day he was with his evangelism team. They were going up to a seldom reached village in the Hawaiian mountains. And you remember we used to have those little digital cameras that would run out of power if you didn't charge them up. Well, one of the guys was like, Kahu, we've got like 15 seconds left. Like send a message to the congregation, pushes record. Well, he's sweating and he's hacking his way through this forest with this machete. But without hesitation, he turns around and he goes, Hey, so where have you guys been? Have you been on the mission? Come on, come follow us. Let's follow the Great Commission and get to the mission. Jesus loves you. And it cuts out. I remember watching that. And I remember thinking, that's exactly what I want to be doing when Jesus comes back. I want to be passionate and ready. Okay, group participation time. How many of you here think we should be passionate for Jesus and his purposes in the earth? Raise your hand. Okay, how many of you think passion and purpose are connected together? Raise your hand. Okay, interesting. Come on in, guys. Interesting. Oh, by the way, we have cookies going around, so please grab one. Okay, um, This is how we do it. This is kind of Coppell style. We're doing it like women's Bible study style a little bit. Okay. So how many of you again think passion and purpose are connected? Raise your hand. Okay. So interestingly enough, this is going to take us to Mark 12. But before we do, we've got to stop, drop, and pray and and ask the Holy Spirit to guide us. Let's do that. In Hawaiian, it's let's go to Father Apuli Kako. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this time. Lord, we pray for all the speakers right now, for for Jack, who's nearby speaking, for Dix. And Lord, we just pray that you would work through the speakers and what they've worked out with you privately, Lord, that they would just simply share publicly. And Lord, we know that there, of course, is a time for us to defend your truth, but right now we just want to feast on it together. So thank you for that. Thank you for this Uh, Grace Evangelical Society and just the many benefits it's had in my life. And I just pray that our our families, our friends, and our ministries would experience our vitality and our aliveness. Lord, through your spirit, in your name we pray. Amen. Okay, first let's talk passion, zeal, and fervor. They're all synonyms, right? Okay, if you asked what's passion, somebody might say, well, it's when you're engaged in something that is truly meaningful to you. It's the euphoria you experience when you're engaged in something that's meaningful, but it's not the full meaning, guys. The word itself, passion, derives from the Latin root word, pati, okay, which means to suffer. Therefore, at the root of passion is suffering. So it's not just euphoria or pleasure. So this is something that moves us to persevere at something despite fear, unhappiness, or pain. And it's the determination to endure suffering for the sake of an end goal. Romans 12, 11 says, never lacking in zeal, but keep your what? Spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. And then here we have it through strongs. We have KJV through strongs, not slothful in business, but fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, literally boiling over with interest or desire. In other words, our spiritual passion should be 
boiling hot, so to speak. Like when you cook pasta for the kids and you put the water on, you put the lid on it, you turn it all the way up, you forget about it, right? You come back and it's like boiling over like that. That's how passionate we should be for God. There, on the neuro side of this, a much-cited passion researcher named Valorland goes so far as to con- and conclude, passion is what makes life worth living because in the neuro field, our attachment to life is based on our interest in it. I'm going to take it a step further to say its framework provides Christians with the ability to overcome obstacles that we're going to experience sooner or later on our Christian journey. Amen? So, That's passion. Now, I want to go through three scenarios of what can happen with our passion. Okay, number one, passion is present. That's a good thing. So if you're a note taker, write it down because you'll retain like 40% more if you actually write it down. Okay, number one, passion is present. That's the first scenario. Passion is present. You're alive and awake with the purposes of God. You know what? You know what Jesus was passionate about? You know what he had a steady inward fire about? The word. The word of God. When the enemy came to tempt him in the desert, he didn't just say, be gone. He said, it is written. And on the night that he was betrayed, and guys, betrayal, I mean, that entails so much. I mean, her and just a, a moment of weakness. And Peter, remember, trusting in the wrong sword, defends him. And what does Jesus say in Matthew 26? To paraphrase, he said, don't you know I could call to my father and he would send 12 legions of angels? But then, oh Peter, how would the scriptures be fulfilled? And then when he's walking and he sees the two women weeping on the side of the road, he quotes Hosea to them. And then when he's finally on the cross and everything's being taken away, he quotes Psalm 22. Now, what does this, what does this tell us? In his pain, in his moment of trial, he was passion, patty, suffered, and was focused on the word, okay? It fueled him. Also, also reward, okay? Hebrews 12, 2, for the what? Joy. Okay, ooh, I like it when y'all talk. That's so good. I grew up in a talking church, right? Dad, everyone's talking. So, We get too stiff, I think. So, yes, for the what? Joy set before him. He endured the cross, okay? He endured. Now, the doctrine of rewards is necessary for the proper determination to suffer. We must recognize God as the wage payer for our works. Kingdom entrance, that's a gift. That's believing in Jesus for everlasting life. That's John 3, 16, 5, 24, 6, 47, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. It's a free gift, amen? Okay, we should all be amening that, okay? That's amen. But suffering, you want to you suffer? You want to count the cost? You want to you you have that faithful endurance? Sorry, Yeshua draws the line there. And that's where he's willing to pay us, in a sense, like, the, like a good father heart of God wants to give good gifts to his children. Now, I timed this out, and I don't know if you've ever experienced the thrill of flight, but we've got to fly. And I'm so sorry. I want you guys to be able to look this up later, so get like your phones ready if you want to take a picture. I'm not going to be able to go through all of them, but I want you to have the idea of the five crowns. I take the view they're all individual And um, I have a framework by which I hope we can memorize this today. So you're going to see the scripture, the crown, and the purpose. There's five crowns that Christians may or may not merit at the Bama seat of Christ. And if they're unable to merit this crown, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27, okay, even Paul was worried to be adakimas, okay, so... They, that reward would perish in a sense, okay, if they weren't able to merit this crown. The incorruptible crown, the crown of righteousness, the crown of life, the crown of glory, the crown of rejoicing. And all five crowns, I've taken the first letter from each of them. And here's how I want you to memorize these, okay? They are, everyone look up, everyone, everyone look up, look up, look up, okay? <laughs> they are intrinsically rad. Life-giving rewards. Let's say that, okay? Intrinsically rad. 
Okay, they are. They are intrinsically rad. You know what? We should put this on our dash. We should put this on our mirror. We should put this in our car, on our fridge. We should keep these in the mind when we're serving, okay? Two main things. I'm sorry we can't go through all of them. Gaining mastery over the flesh. You're all doing that, right? You're all submitting to the spirit and putting to death, disciplining your body. If you forfeit that crown, I will not be pleased. <laughs> Righteousness. Longing for his appearing. Hey, that's Matthew 25, 13. Uh, watch. You don't know the hour. Matthew, uh, Titus 2, 13. I love because it's, uh, we wait looking to the, to the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus. Longing for his appearing. I beg of you, do not miss that hour. Be watching, be waiting, be longing. Okay, I've got to fly. Two main things I want you to know about this, okay? Number one, these purposes are important to God. We're talking about a passion for Jesus and his purposes in the earth. These are specific purposes. Otherwise, guys, he would not be giving a crown for them, okay? These are important to God. These purposes, gaining mastery over the flesh, longing for his appearing, enduring trials, shepherding God's people and sharing your faith soul winning. And when I meet with women and they say, oh, I'm so pumped for this. And then after a year, they're tired. Of course, we sit and we talk story and we dialogue and you're there with them in that. And I'm always sure to include. Stay the course. God will reward you for that. God will reward you for that. Write that one down. I want everybody saying that to be encouraging to Christians. God will reward you for that. Okay, second thing, okay, what is amnesia? <laughs> it is the condition God gives women to have more than one child. See, moms, you knew it would hurt. We knew it would be suffering. And I'm not just talking in labor. I'm talking the bloating, the back pain, the nausea, the hair growing crazy, all of it. Okay? But listen, through enduring suffering, a beautiful, joyful reward was on the other side. Amen? That's the connection between the physical and the spiritual. Do not miss that. And we're crazy enough to do it again. Okay? Enduring suffering like a soldier of Christ. Enduring that faithful, steadfast um, discipline. Looking to the blessed hope. So these are many purposes that we want to keep on the forefront of our mind. Okay. The next scenario. Okay. First one is passion is. Okay. Second one that can happen. Passion is. Lacking. Uh-oh. That's the yellow. Okay. Passion is lacking. We can, as Christians, we recognize in free grace, we can lack passion. Christians can lack passion. Uh, so we're lacking proper engagement. The opposite would be, you know, apathy. And you know what? Real life, guys, it's easier to let passion be siphoned away by routine, stress, and fear. That's easier, okay? And let our purpose and vitality drift. But then our families, our ministries, and our friends miss out. And do we? Is there a crown for that? We miss out. Okay. Third scenario. Passion is misdirected. Passion is misdirected. We have passion, but it's misdirected away from God and towards self, towards the world. And passion misdirected only causes a mess. Scenarios two and three are lacking something scenario one has. What is that? The word. The word which contains his purposes, okay, gives us passion. Passion and purpose go together. Okay, a friend of mine named Tim owns a camp out in East Texas, and he directed camp for us growing up. One summer, one of his sons announced he's going off to military school and, um, oh, I should mention, Tim is a great gifted teacher, and he knows a lot of Hebrew and Greek, okay? He taught sometimes at camp and stuff. So while the son's at military school, he texts him a picture, and he goes, hey, Dad, can you interpret this? Well, the picture appeared to be an odd combination of Latin and Hebrew. And Tim, a busy guy, said, not without much work, 
meaning it would take time for him, right, to interpret that. Well, he meant to look at it later, but forgot. Fast forward, the military son comes home, and he proudly pulls down his shirt and reveals a tattoo spanning the width of his chest. He goes, Dad, how do you like it? And Tim goes, well, what does it mean? He goes, what do you mean, what does it mean? It means not without much work. Tim freezes as it dawns on him. His son took his text as the literal translation. It was actually a text heralding some ancient ruler, and it was not what he thought it was. Oh, that's ill-advised. Okay. My point is this. We need to know the text. We need to know God's. We can't, we can't rely on somebody else. We can't go to the gym and watch everyone else work out and expect to get strong. No way. Passion comes from the word of God. Amen. So here's the passion for Jesus and his word can be cultivated. Passion can be turned on and turned off. We can go towards Jesus and towards aliveness or away from it. Passion comes from God's word. And his word tells us how and for what we were created. So I submit today that we must first understand how we were created. Raise your hand if you love America. Do you have any patriots in the room? Okay, why? Why do you, y'all shout out, why do you love America? Freedoms, okay, what else? Okay, home, what else? Opportunity, land of opportunity. Okay, If you said, I love America, and someone says, why, and you gave these answers, we enjoy many great benefits as citizens. We have freedoms. We have liberties. And did you know our enjoyment of these benefits lies in how America was created and founded to begin with? Our founding fathers set her up and established her with purpose and therein benefits for us to enjoy. Our objective today is to study how we as humans were founded by our founding father, how we were created, and for what overarching purpose exactly. We saw specific purposes earlier. What's the point? What's the overarching point? Turn to Matthew 12, uh, Mark 12, excuse me, Mark 12, verses 13 through 17. Jesus is showing us in Mark story by story that he has authority. He's showing us what? He has authority. Let's try it again. He has what? Okay, he's demonstrating his authority to forgive sins. Mark 2.10, authority over the wind and waves. Mark 4.35 through 41, to heal the demon-possessed man. In Mark 5, Jairus' daughter, the woman with bleeding. The temple, specifically authority to cleanse the temple with righteous anger. And some groups did not like this. Tension has been building. You see? They didn't like it, didn't like it, didn't like it, didn't like it. And here we are in verse 13. Look with me. Then they sent to him some of the Pharisees and Herodians. Pause right there. It's almost meant to make us go like, whoa, like what's happening? When you see those two groups together, because guys, they weren't hanging out at GES or anything. Mm -mm. They were at enmity with one another. Okay? They had no small disagreements. We know the Pharisees were this devout Jewish party. Okay? So they're together, but I'm splitting them. The Pharisees were this devout Jewish party. They were strict, legalistic, and deeply Jewish in their roots, religiously motivated and invested, and they cared a lot about the law. Group participation. What did they care about? Okay, the Herodians, conversely, were more of the liberal Jewish party in regards to the law. They were more politically motivated rather than religiously motivated. They were loyal to Herod, after all. That's where they got their name, Herodians, the pseudo-Jewish ruler who derived his authority from, you guys know where? Rome, the enemy. So their allegiance was to Rome. And they were more okay with that because they were actually more favorable to Greek influence into Roman rule. And as you can imagine, these guys did not get along. And the Pharisees would look at the Herodians and go, those double-minded traitors, they're for Rome. And or, or, the Pharisees would look at the Herodians and say, yeah, they're for Rome. You know, Caesar isn't our God. And the Herodians would look at the Pharisees and go, those strict legalistic guys, they've got to get with the powers to be. Okay. 
um, but they're together. And yet here they come together. But why? Why together? They've come with a purpose. We're talking about purposes. Okay. They've come with a purpose. And it's at the end of verse 13. To catch him in his words. Catch, literally snare. Joe, you hunt, right? You lay a snare, right? Okay. We could say it like this. Jesus is a hunted man. And they're bringing their best shot at him. The trap they set ever so carefully, ever so intellectually, shrouded in flattery and posed as an important question that demands answering. Teacher, verse 14, we know that you are truthful or true and care about no one for you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God in truth. Here's their question. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? They're bringing the heat. I don't intend to offend anyone here, but I do intend to paint a picture of how intense this could get, okay? Go back to 2020. Masks or no masks? Answer us, Catherine. Pro-choice or pro-life? Answer me now. But the political message here cannot be missed. They're bringing the heat. And their question is about the tax. And the tax is a big deal to them. Everybody in Judea was taxed, sometimes called the census tax, the head tax, the poll tax. And it was imposed by Rome. It was one denarius a year, so not a tremendous amount. It was the amount of a field laborer's day wage. So the concern was not one of economics necessarily, but the political message behind the tax. The Jews viewed Rome and its agenda as evil. Jews knew God was their rightful ruler, but here Caesar is coming and saying they should surrender to him instead. So to the common Jew, the tax itself was such an outrage because it was a symbol of foreign oppression and domination. And because it was paid with a coin, the denarius that bore the picture of the emperor and the text encircling it heralded him as divinity. We see why they didn't like that, right? There was a purpose to Caesar's image on these coins. He created the coins. They were minted with his image for the purpose of politics, trade, and economics. His image provided authentication and authority. So for a lot of these Jews, the annual tax was like at the top of the list of objectionable or uh, um, offensive things that Rome had required for them to do. The Pharisees and Herodians stand for two representations of thought. The Pharisees object to acknowledging Caesar as God and giving him that symbol. And on the other hand, the Herodians, who are more or less pro-Roman rule, right? They're more okay with that. They ask Jesus a question, and the setup is like this. If Jesus is pro-tax, like the Herodians, then the Pharisees hear his response and think, pro-tax, pro-Rome. And they slander him before the crowds. And they say, he's a traitor. He is an idol in that symbol and is paying homage in a sense. Look at the coin he gives back to the emperor who calls himself king. Caesar, Caesar isn't our king. And they could try to manipulate and twist, twist the crowds that they may have even finally had opportunity to seize him. Remember all through Mark, how he's showing his authority? Maybe this is their moment they could seize him. On the other hand, if Jesus is anti-tax, like the Pharisees who say, don't pay that to Caesar. Don't give the denarius to him. Don't support that image. The Herodians hear that and they tell Rome, off with his head. The treason, the sedition, and they think they have sufficiently secured their, their trap. The irony, guys, of the situation is that they're coming to Jesus with a matter of currency to see what he's worth in a sense. But Mark is going to make it very clear at the end of this, that it's Jesus who will end up testing and exposing their hearts. And the people marvel at Jesus. Let us analyze their question in verse 15. Shall we pay or shall we, what do they say? Not pay. See how they try to make it simple with just those two options presented? Now, I'm a speech language pathologist by trade, y'all. So what do I like? Words, sounds, and in that syntax. And God is so good to often draw my eye to this, okay? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? Makes me curious, their question. 
Does it sound like anything we've read before? Think, Bible student, does that sound like anything? Look one chapter earlier at the end of 11, verses 30 and 31. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Answer me. And they reasoned among themselves saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe in him? Verse 32, but if we say from men, they feared the people. Okay, guys, so guess what? They think they're using his moves on him. It's like a TikTok dance, like his moves on him. Okay, they think they're using his moves on him. And they're like, we've got him in a trap. There's no way out. Just like he did us, an impossible question to answer. But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, why are you testing me? And guys, this is a mini lesson for teachers in the room. Because, I mean, Jesus knows the value of time by employing it well. He's not going to spend his time like answering these empty questions forever. But he'll engage with them. He'll dialogue with them. What does he say? Bring me a denarius. We see an imperative command. He could have said, you guys all know the denarius, the most common coin used in Jerusalem. You know, just picture it. It's like me saying, picture a quarter. But no, he says, bring it to me. Why? Two reasons I see in the, maybe more, but two reasons I mainly see in the text. This call for a visual demonstration suggests what? Number one, what? He doesn't have the coin. He doesn't carry it. So if they're wondering about his fidelity to God, they've got their answer. He doesn't have that idol on it. Okay? He's not giving his allegiance to Caesar, and he shows this in a gracious, tactful way. Number two, can anyone guess it? He doesn't have the coin, but, but what? Bring me suggests they do. They have the coin. They have it. My imagination just like kind of runs wild. I'm like, I just imagine them. Maybe they have like a purse full of it. They're just like run. They're like, I got it. They're like, you didn't pick up on that. You know, one guy in the back like runs up with it. Maybe they had an idol and wanting to keep the money, not pay the tax. I don't know. But the question comes in verse 16. So they brought him one. He said to them, whose inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. This is a picture of the coin. The text encircling its border is a Latin abbreviation, which reads Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus, a.k.a. Tiberius Caesar, the son of God. They all knew what was on it, right? That's why for the common Jew, it was so objectionable. They knew who made the graven image and they knew who minted it with blasphemous words and they knew who it belonged to. You guys, I, it's great. I always know where my kids play because I just follow the trail. They're so creative. One time there was a toilet paper like going from the bathroom and then Chloe had like swaddled all her babies, these new swaddles just like wrapped up. I'm like, I know who's been here. This is like creation creator. I get it. I know who this is. It's easy, easy peasy. That's Chloe because ownership is due to its creator. So Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and render to God the things that are God's. Render to God the things that are God's. Here's my question. Here's the whole point of all of this. What things belong to God? What things should be rendered or repaid? Render here, guys, doesn't just mean to pay. It means to repay, to give again, send it back, give it back, return the idol back to Caesar. You don't have to give Caesar your worship, your allegiance, your life, but you can give that coin back. You can give that idol back, but give only to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. The coin was minted in his image after all. So give it back. Repay it to him. Render to God 
the things that are God's? What things should be rendered or repaid to God? You know the answer based off Jesus' words? The things which bear his image. The text says likeness, and in the Greek, icon, literally image. Whose image is it? Whose image is it? Guys, he's not talking about coins. He's talking about you, his radiant image bearers, minted with the undeniable print and authority with great purpose in life, in his likeness. And they marveled. Jesus' audience would have been familiar with Genesis 1, and 27. In Latin, it's referred to as the passage of the Imago Dei. And we know this, God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Okay, in 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. The words image and likeness should not be understood as referring to two different things, but rather as interchangeable terms that reflect a Hebrew form of par- uh, synonymous parallelism. And I do take the view, there's, if you want more research on it, come talk to me after, I don't have time, but there's three views on the Imago Dei, um, the, the relational view, the functional view, and the representational view. Structural doesn't make sense, guys, because even though speech and song help us project the image, Okay, and, and share Jesus, unborn children, do they still have God's image? So I take it as representation rather than structure. Okay? It's beautiful, yes, when we serve God and we reflect his image and all these things. That's great. But you guys, even more elemental, it is fitting. It is right. Because this is how our founding father set things up. This is how he created us. We've made, been made by him and for him. Psalm 100 verse 3, Know the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. Colossians 1 16, All things were created through him and for him. You know, when I tuck in my kids, I want to remind them of this, that they are dearly loved, that they have been made in his image, in his likeness, minted with great purpose. Because the enemy likes to attack us knowing our purpose. Okay, that's how I'm going to define identity, knowing our purpose, knowing our identity. Like they're his biggest threats. And you know what? Maybe they are. What happens when scenario number two from earlier, when we withhold from God our passion, withhold our purpose purpose in our lives? In short, nothing good. What about scenario number three, when we misplace passion? Worldly pleasure, which is pleasurable but passing. Material things, kingdom of thingdom. Addiction, not changing your playmates or your playground. It's never going to satisfy It's never going to set, not like you were made for it. It's not going to produce that joyful reward for sure. And it may even have temporal consequences. Because people will render themselves to the world and scenario number three, misplaced passion. I mean, they'll take off work, fly across the country to be in the presence of some person, this pseudo glory, some athlete or musician. And it's the biggest ripoff we could ever do is to create some or, or to worship something that's created, right? So, you know, anyways, it's, I, it's and, uh, how much time do I have? Okay, six minutes still. Okay, we're going we're gonna to fly. Okay, so guys, to me, there's a difference, and I know this is going to be hard, just try to be with me, and I'm not all dantanant. You know, in Hawaii, they say pride is like dantanant. I'm not, I'm right here with you, okay? I'm right here with you. I know this is going to be hard. Just try to receive it. I'm not all done. Thin on. I'm right here with you. Okay. This is for me too. Okay, guys. So we come, I'll put it in Hawaiian partly. Okay. They say, cause you go church and you go conference and you go to make sure your doctrine is sound, but are we sound asleep carrying it out Monday through Saturday? <sighs> okay. Misplaced passion. To me, there's a difference between the desire to do it and actually doing it. He who loves me keeps my commandments. Not he who loves me has some kind of desire, but never actually does it. Okay? This is for Christians, okay? There's a difference between that. Maybe we should change some of the worship songs to, I am a friend of God, I'm close to God, to I kind of desire to, but I don't want to give up the world for him. Maybe we should change it up. You have been made 
through him and for him. And we know that we can live such weak Christian lives because we don't want to do. Or maybe we think we can't, I don't know, overcome flesh. Come on, like he's come overcome the world. Combat the lie. It is written. You've been made through him and for him. Okay, why are we here? At a Texas camp in the middle of Lake Louisville learning about Jesus. Because 2,000 years ago, Jesus took 11 Jewish men and they rendered themselves to God and committed themselves to Yeshua at the highest level. Passion and purpose are linked. They're intertwined. And we're not alone in our testimony because I wake up at Camp Copus and there's this bird singing like crazy, super loud. You go out at night, you see the stars. The stars are shining. They're doing what they were created to do. Are we? What did the stars think of us? You remember uh, Romans 1.20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. Uh, Romans 8.19, Romans 9.22. So if all creation aches and groans and wants to see those sons of God, what are we to be doing as the crown of his creation? Every time a human paints a landscape, enjoys a symphony, calculates a sum, or names a pet. They are showing that they are the crown of his creation. What are we doing? About, well, six minutes. I'm going to skip part of it. The world is going to attempt to entice you, but God compels you to more. I'm not denying that the world is alluring. What I'm saying, it's never going to satisfy for the reward, okay? For the joy. Um, I have a three-minute Switchfoot song, guys. Okay, I'm going to play. I'm going to go for it, okay? It's free time, so we're, we're cutting it in. We should be going, okay? Sermonettes make Christianettes, like the quality, okay? So we're going to keep going. Okay. 20 years ago, I was 16 years old. I got my driver's license. I was in Garland in my not, not used, just pre-owned 1998 Honda CRV, red, listening to the Switchfoot song. And I was hooked. I loved it so much. Um, and in 2021, they uh, came out with an album in Tarobang and have a song called Fluorescent. And it's made my top three favorite uh, Switchfoot songs of all time. It's the story about a moth and a gas station light, and it's drawn to it. Earlier in uh, Foreman's music, he used fluorescent light and the moth's attraction to it, like fake man-made light. And he uses fluorescent light earlier in songs to emulate a false light. And it is, in fact, an artificial light. Can we agree with that? Okay. So the mouth is trying passionately. So which scenario is that? Third, misdirected. Trying passionately, he says, beating his wings against the dusty window to pursue it, to reach satisfaction. A light that is a fake out of the real thing. Okay, this may be the first time a rock song has been played at GS, and it may be the last. So just enjoy it. We're going to focus on the, on the lyrics, and I'm going to pause twice for commentary, and then I'm going to skip to conclusion. Is that fair? We might cut into some time. Um, and guys, this is our world, okay? And this, this is... This is probably more rampant and common than you even think meets the eye. People trying to pursue and misplace passion. So let's, I'm um, going to go ahead and, and play this. Now the moth is going to be mankind. The light is the world. And he's trying to beat against the wings, misplace passion. I am the moth beating his wings against a dusty window. Outside of your dull fluorescent light. Youth was dark with the simple things. You had your light, I had my wings. You were the brightest star in the black night. A fluorescent girl in the city light. I'm a fluorescent favorite. I want to you remind 
How, how long can you satisfy me? How long can you last me in permanence or fulfill me? We're going to hear the next part of this describes how clear their outcome is and how desperate it is, the dynamic between the moth and the light. And herein lies the folly of the pursuit of it. Okay. This is a desperate song. You're not that bright. You're not that strong. And the outcome looks exceedingly clear. We are always separate. Always here. The lesson favorite. I'll be to you and mine. Today, 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 The moth and us drawn to something that won't save it, but will destroy and deceive. It seemed like the brightest thing around in the night. It seemed like an attractive thing to be passionate about. But as time passes, two scenarios are presented. One, either the moth reaches its limits physically or mentally, or two, the fluorescent light, like all man-made light, goes out. We're going to hear one final portion of this the moth's pursuit of this pseudo sun imitator. Let's listen. This is the last chorus. You were the brightest star in the black night. My fluorescent girl in the city light. I'm the rest of favorite. I'm the new mind. Today, you can turn the lights on. The moth is continually chasing and thinking just a little bit more and I'll be fulfilled. And I'm saying it's never going to satisfy that joyful reward that we're talking about. So seeking fulfillment in this present world, con to conclude, is a complete abdication of our responsibility as image bearers. We need to render ourselves to God. If not, it's the abandoning or discarding of a right. Let us ask this. If this is fake light, then what's real light? What's sun? And how can we bask in it and receive fullness of benefit. My college roommate used to do late night Taco Bell runs, okay? And Taco Bell applies to the fluorescent light because it too is cheap and man-made. No offense. I know it was your first job. No offense. And if I was studying and I hadn't eaten dinner, she'd say, hey, Nick, you want anything? And I'm like, oh, I mean, it's 10 p.m., but the crunchity crunch wrap with mild sauce, sure. See? Because I wasn't filled up, it was all the more alluring. But let's say I came back from dinner, grass-fed mignon, the herbs, vegetables with the flaky sea salt. She said, you want anything? It's like, I'm good. I'm satisfied. Novelist Gabrielle Marquez tells the story of a man trying to solve 
the world's problems. And we're going to get to that. I have to share my favorite verse, Psalm 34, 8. It says, taste and see that the Lord is good. It's not enough to smell it cooking. It's not enough to hear everyone else say how good it is. You have to open up your mouth and taste it for yourself. Novelist Gabriel Marcus tells the story of a man trying to solve the world's problems. <laughs> but since I often do that myself these days, I'm switching the example to more accurately reflect my reality. The story is one of a mom trying to solve the world's problems and her problems in the world. When her young son comes into the room, and asks if he can help. Touched by the boy's concern, but impatient to get on with her work, she takes a map of the world, cuts it into random pieces, and gives it to the boy, telling him he can help by piecing the world back together. Well, the boy doesn't have a clue what the world looks like, but takes the pile of paper off to his room. Two days later, he rushes to his mother. Mom, mom, he says, I've put the world together. And indeed, the paper pieces have been meticulously taped back together. When the mom asks how he did it, the boy turns the map over. On the back was a picture of a person. He said, I put the person back together and then turned it over, and the world was back together. Guys, changing the world, Denton, Capel, Canioi, San Diego, Denton, starts with us, his radiant image bearers. As we are passionate about Jesus and his purposes in the earth, and gang, I want to see his light shining in the center of your eyes. Come back to GES next year. And come back with stories on how you've rendered yourself to Yeshua. And stay passionate, okay? Stay boiling hot passionate for Jesus and his purposes and for his soon return. So let's subdue enemies, expand his kingdom, and achieve greatness by his spirit as an image bearer. Okay, that's it. We really did it today. All right. And reflection, I always ask this anytime I speak. Three questions. First one, did you learn anything about God today? Second question, are you willing to obey it? Third question, are you willing to share it? If you want to write it down and just reflect on it, I would love to um, talk to you more. But do we have time for any Q&A? Have <laughs> we gone way over? There's my email if you guys want that, um, like what I was mentioning, the research on the three different views of Imago Day, um, And then... Oh, my site, if you want me to come out to your church, I'm happy to speak with you on that. But what questions do we have for those? And if you need to go, please feel free to go. Any questions? Is that it? I enjoy you, Sharon Wilkin. <laughs> okay, yeah, thanks. So fun. Hey, thanks for coming. Hey, guys. Yay.